Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian. And I'm Ethan. And today we have a 75 point War Machine battle report for you. And this one's special because it's with the newly reworked Battle Box casters. So this week I'm playing Tanith the Feral Song. I wanted to try out her, see if the the dynamic update quality of life changes for her, how badly or how much they helped her. And this week I'm playing in Wild Hunt. Uh, Tanith has two Wold Weirds, a Pure Blood, and an Argus Moonhound in her battle group. I have a Well of Orboros, a three Gallows Groves as a rec option, three War Wolves as a rec option, and then Uno one with a Storm Raptor, Hermit, Chuck Dogwood, the Death Wolves, and a Shifting Stone unit. So I'm kind of light on units, and it's really leveraging Una and protecting the Storm Raptor, and then just kind of mulching infantry because like the death wolves on their own can clear infantry once like single wound living or undead infantry and then like the raptor can pulse and like you can affliction a unit and then wold weirds just triple tap it or pure blood sprays so i'm interested this was interested to see how this list would perform i know tanith is a hot take on what theme she wants to be in but wild hunts where i play it for my list, I'm going back to what you would consider probably my main faction is Kador. And we've got uh, Lord Kozlov, the Viscount of Scars Skarsgård. Sorry, Jeepers. So uh, I decided to play him in Armor Core. I think it is probably where he feels best right now. Um, I ended up kind of balancing my battle group and the rest of my list with uh, with units. So I've got a Grey Lord adjunct. Uh, two Juggernauts and a Marauder filling out his battle group. I am bringing a Manowar Siege Chariot with me just because I've had this thing for a really long time, painted it, and played it once, and then never touched it again. So I just wanted to kind of dust it off and throw it on the table. I have one Manowar Covenant. Saxon Auric is in here. Two Rec Options as uh, Suppression Tankers. And then I have Bulkhead in here as well. Uh, I have a full unit of Manowar Shock Troopers with their officer, and then a full unit of Manowar Demo Core with uh, Dragos in it. So the gist here is just to play Armored Core. I mean, uh, Kozlov has been changed in a way that makes uh, Manowar just feel really good with him in general. He did well with them before, but giving them a speed boost and still maintaining their ab the ability to increase their damage output is really good for them. And uh, some of the other spells he's picked up are uh, pretty legit for them as well, but it's really leveraging that feat with Manowar that make him a prime candidate for Armor Core. <laughs> So I won the roll to go first with a two, so that was really exciting. Uh, <laughs> and you'll notice my Well of Orbros is proxied by the stupid Infernal model because I left mine at home and it's and been so it, long I forgot what was here and what wasn't. This is your punishment. You get to you get to play the Infernal Gate for the superior support battle engine model for uh, leaving your well at home. Yep, and my Tanith is also at home, so <laughs> instead of my bright green Tanith, you get to see an Arcanist with a big stick. Yep. Pretend to be Tanith. So I'm just running my Warwolves up. Storm Raptor ran. Uh, Una put up Guardian Beast and just charged forward. She has bird's eye so she can see through the bird. And basically, it's all about positioning. Like, I have two Warwolves on the bottom, a Warwolf on top. And, like, the Death Wolves and the Pure Blood are leaning towards the top zone because the Wolves are going to be trying to hold down that zone. They don't start with corpses in Wild Hunt, but, like, there's some cute stuff you can do where, like, okay, I can shoot my own, like, war wolves to give corpses. And here, Brian forgot to do his advance move, so... He decided to take it halfway through my first turn. Yep, that's that's how we do things around here. I just uh, sandbag my rules and then play off of Ethan's kindness to get there. But you can see I also chunked up my demo core, so like I just really would prefer that this stupid benefit was advanced deploy. No, man. Four-inch move? Legit. Super great to clunk your army up together with. Mm. So my trees are just kind of shifting up, waiting. Uh, I figured when Brian like gave me the side that his battle engine was going to go towards the bottom that's why i put two werewolves i probably should have put three because i love those little things and the well did summon a reeve hunter this turn which will be proxied by um what's her name Brig 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 brigid brigid sorry uh because again it's been so long i thought i had one in my bag and i did not she should be here though you've played her a bazillion times but a i think we a never reeve mind. hunter no, I've no, never played. Never mind. Bridget, Bridget was in your pack Bridget because you he used her. <laughs> and then that's it for me. <laughs> 
Alright, so turn one comes around for me. I appreciate being further up the table, but my army's still really slow, so I have to try and find ways to leverage the survivability of my army while still trying to mitigate some of the damage that can be done with this bird. Uh, Una controlling the Storm Raptor, I feel like, is probably the real caster of this game right now. Not that Tianeth's bad, it's just that that's my focal point of like wanting to deal with that. And trying to figure out how to get to Una is going to be really difficult, especially with my army, since the only person who has some reach out and touch someone is Saxon Auric or maybe Kozlov throwing a bunch of Razor Winds. But that doesn't seem to be happening anytime, happening anytime soon with uh, a bunch of uh, Weirwoods, or not Weirwoods, Jesus. Old Weirds. Old Weirds hanging around. I've got Ice and Fire on the brain, sorry. And uh, the so I just have to try and, and maybe this is like... Sometimes when I play Kador, especially Armor Core, I really just get into this mode of I'm just going to present everything and see what you can do with it because that's just kind of how I like to play. I prefer to present a lot of problems to my opponent and then try and see how they respond to untying those problems so that I can then come back to my turn and then solve the issues that I need to try and fix. Because I always feel like Kador has always been an answer faction and not a question faction. So I just kind of set myself up to be able to respond best to how my opponent responds to me just throwing everything up there. Unfortunately, on this top zone, I have to really scrunch in these shock troopers to get them to fit there. They've got the uh, march from the or desperate pace from the Co Covenant. They've got uh, tactical supremacy, so they get to run up nine inches and just be really up in the business there and threaten those circle models. So this is where I get to apologize for. I shouldn't have to apologize for this one. The stupid camera did this and not me not checking a battery. The the For whatever reason, my memory card likes to just kind of like go wonky while it's recording. So uh, we missed a whopping 20 minute Ethan turn. But if you compare the two, fo the photo back <laughs> with the end of the turn, it looks like nothing has actually happened here. So let's let what 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 did you do here for 20 minutes that made you develop this board state, Ethan? I decided to remember <laughs> how to play the game after not playing for a month and remember how all my rules work. So what ended up happening going from the bottom, I last turn, I didn't say it, but I put Admonition out on one of the World Weirds, and I put Scything Touch on one of the War Wolves. And that's like a super cute tech in this theme. Any buffs you can do to War Wolves or debuffs, just turn those free points up to like legit heavy threats. So what I did was the Scything Touch War Wolf ran up, into Sikkim range of the battle engine one of the werewolves was in straight like charge range of it so what i did is the reeve hunter after like some of the shifting stones teleported and moved out of the way assaulted the battle engine so then my scything touch werewolf could charge it so it's mat six gets boosted the hit because of Sikkim and is only pow 11 but then scything touch makes him effectively pow 13. he gets a free boosted charge now the other Warwolf charges, he gets Sikkim, boosted the hit, so he's POW 11, 13 because of Dark Shroud, and Gang Fighter up to 15, so it's dice minus 4? Yep. Or dice minus 3 on the battle. It's dice engine. minus 4, they're 19. Dice minus 4, and like he blew it up, and then like because of the way the angles worked, at max half inch, I'm able to, and people can contest this, this is how we thought it on the table, and I know we've like played this in Mark II, where the Warwolf at max half inch can charge around a huge base staying in melee range to get another charge. So I was able to sick him charge out of activation, then charge again, and I basically left the battle engine on eight boxes. Yeah, it wasn't a ton of boxes left on and it. And that's just from th two war wolves that are free. And then the weird moved up, popped it, killed it, and then like shot another dude. The bird moved up, shot a few shock troopers, and then repoed back. The cute thing with Una in Guardian Beast, if you don't know the Storm Raptor trick, Guardian Beast is if you end your movement within six inches of Una, the Raptor can make a fully boosted to hit or fully, a fully bo boosted attack. Fully boosted attack, so melee or ranged, yep. and it has disruption on its beak. So if a jack with one inch melee comes in, you can get a fully boosted POW 18 disruption beak. Or if there's infantry, you can get a fully boosted to hit and then E leap off of it to kill two dudes. So, like, that's some cute tech there. And then on the top zone, uh, Tanith, Brian forgot that her gun has Shadowbind. He, she moved up, popped one of the shock troopers, 
shadow bound it so now that whole unit's clumped up and put out affliction yep it's literally like the one thing that tanith had prior to the dynamic update that made her like interesting and i totally spaced it and was just, i gave you four shock troopers to just keep in that back area yep and then i put affliction so that way the pure blood could just be like okay i spray one point one point one point weird just shoots one point one point one point and then like i boosted a couple times in there and that was pretty much my turn like just positioning and killing position, a battle yeah, engine. position control and and stuffing my battle engine down my throat yep So coming up to turn two for me, I've kind of realized the folly of my ways here. I picked this side of the table because I thought that giving Ethan defensive areas to put his caster uh, to start scoring zones was not a good idea. Like Because behind that, that uh, house, there's a bit of the zone hanging out. And behind the rock that's in the middle, there's, of course, plenty of zone hanging there so that you can get in there and still be blocked. But uh, I didn't want to have Tanith getting a good bunker, so I figured leaving her out in the open was better. But now that I see this, the the I'm now that I'm reaping the the what I sow, uh, I'm not super happy that my almost entire army is cut off from being able to affect Tanith or that pure blood because of the way the rock is. And now Ethan's basically just made the house bigger by turning my mana war into uh, into statues, really. So there's. I'm kind of in a weird spot right now in terms of what to do. Also, losing my battle engine wasn't super great. I probably could have measured things out a little bit better for those dogs. But um, I just uh, have so many flashbacks to even playing Kador into dogs of my huge bases getting tied up to where I should have remembered. But maybe I just blocked that part off in my brain because it was too painful to watch a, to remember a conquest that didn't activate for three turns in a row. Yeah, it got half held by four werewolves back with Grail Stream and Storm Rage around them. Like that was super fun for me. Yeah, it was a it was a cool time. So as many times as I play against Circle, I should know better. But uh, unfortunately, that just kind of did that. So one day I'll get that battle engine back on the table. But for right now, I probably will uh will warm its spot back in its little dust circle. So the things that I'm doing right now, Kozlov had uh, chosen ground up from last turn. I have Fury on my big Juggernaut in the middle and uh, attack supremacy on the shock troopers that don't really get to do anything right now. So we come back after changing the battery and not losing any footage, so take that, internet. Um, the thing that I'm doing with that Marauder on the bottom is I really don't have a lot of great places to put it, and my feet is only really the only thing that really speeds up my battle group. So uh, if I can position Kozlov correctly, I can get the Marauder onto the stupid Requisition War Dog, my 10-point heavy, that would totally brain this bird, is going to go deal with a dog that's free. So if I position Kozlov right, I can get Chosen Ground to cover the Marauder getting out of the pool and getting onto the dog. Uh, I think there was some definite over-allocation of focus here because I kind of forgot that Kozlov gave Gang Fighter to the Jack, so we kind of reversed that a little bit to where I only put one focus on him and do the smart thing but uh after figuring because i wanted to be really accurate with this one i just didn't want to like pull a fast one on ethan and be like yeah i can get i can't get there or find out that i can't get there when i have been really planning hard for it so uh it takes one hit to get the dog because i'm swinging at mat nine and uh i have an additional die for gang fighter because that uh demo core is right there uh it's really important that you can to, to note that in that big gap of mana war that went down drago was the first one to bite the dust so i didn't think that i needed defeat or mini feet on turn one for uh for my little bond of brotherhood but uh it, it turns out that it was probably not the worst idea to try and do that but i just wasn't thinking about uh threat ranges so much so next up here kozlov has feeded already and i'm doing the feat to get in uh mana war on that bird because they're they i switched fury over to this unit so they're swinging at pow 19 with a weapon master attack essentially and uh in my infinite wisdom i thought i was going to be able to get three in there but i didn't measure it out and couldn't get the third one in it was just a sliver off so uh there's a hermit behind the bird and uh since i'm at reach max reach with these uh the bird doesn't get to trigger its guardian beast moves or not guardian beast moves but their uh, guardian beast attacks so the first uh the bottom most demo core just rips the um the tree off the table after the wold weird 
uh, burns away because that was my original charge target and forgot admonition was there. Uh, next, you even moved like the token out I of the know, way yeah. with the stick. I was just I had tunnel vision here. It's like it, it's just one of those days, right? So uh, my one man of war that got the charge off, or one of my two man of war got hermited, and then uh, my second uh, man of war demo core that connected at dice plus one ended up doing like. 11. 11 boxes like it really wasn't that great for them so i've burnt my feet to take out like a good portion of a of a aspect on the bird but i'm not really getting much out of that otherwise i'm run my uh juggernaut up behind and the other tanker behind as well because i think those tankers are good for like pulling down the little support things like we got rid of the reeve and we can actually threaten tana uh, tanith a little bit uh, but I really want to try and start putting some pressure on this bird and trying to take over this zone. Uh, on the other side of the table, I basically can do nothing because now my Juggernaut's chunked up behind my Mana War. And uh, Bulkhead, who is uh, taken taken place by the uh, Forge here, just kind of wraps around the front side of that objective just to kind of take position later. The real big reason why he's over here is so that this other Juggernaut can run to kind of get back into relevance because I'm kind of... I'm basically, like, condemning the top side of the table. So Kozlov's sitting there. He's got a few focus, but he's got a few upkeeps. So, like, I could maybe try and kill him through upkeeps with uh, Witch Hunter Wold Weirds, but I think I can make a scenario play on the bottom. It's his feet turn, so, like, I'm not going to be able to kill uh, Mana Wars that shield walled in the top zone because I only caught the front two, so the back two just shield walled into the front two. And under feet, so they're armor 23, like pure blood's not going to kill him. He would take half his stack just to kill one of them with affliction. <clears throat> and the death wolves, like they don't start with corpses, like I said, so like I don't want to really bury them. But so I'm like debating, does Tana shoot her gun again up there? Because I'd like to keep that up there. But now with bulkhead up in the middle and the other tanker, it's like if Tana wants to keep shooting that, now she's going to be in threat because like... That tanker with the additional die of the hit, if he rolls three shots, like that's boosted the hit. He needs nines, and then it's dice minus five. But with spikes, like that could really hurt. Yeah, those those man war tank, the suppression tankers are they have enough shots potentially to just really swing damage. Weird, especially on warrior model uh, warlocks and warcasters. So they're definitely something to watch out for. Yep, or you just do the big spray at dice minus one. Yep. Uh, so I start with the weird on the bottom. He aims with witch mark. I boost damage, and I'm just popping demo core. Yeah, it doesn't take much for you to pull those down since they have fury on them. It was really unfortunate that I couldn't get more work out of these guys because mm -hmm. I basically traded my feet for you to kill all of them. I mean, you got your feet for the plus two speed and the armor. Yeah. So like you were able like to not bury your army but at least like get them up into the middle mm -hmm. it's just like you have so many upkeeps out there because i think even here like you upkept yeah we talked about this i was like i should have just dropped tactical supremacy because i basically gave you a, gave a world weird a bunch of nice targets to shoot at and i was like ah, i just wasn't thinking yeah like you thought you could shake Shadowbind. bind yeah well, that's just the rust from us I, yeah it's, it's been a been a bit and i just like was not like i said i just wasn't thinking about that bottom side of the zone so I'm shooting with the well, just trying to get some damage out there. I upkept Affliction on the top unit, but Brian killed my Scything, touched Werewolf, and my Admonition triggered, so Tan's sitting on five. I'm not really sure what, like, where she wants to go, so I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, do I want to push top or cycle back towards the bottom? It's just now Brian's got a lot of stuff in the middle, and Tan is only 15-15, so, like... And I'm trying to figure out, like, do I want a feat? Because her feet got changed, so now, like, in Wild Hunt, it doesn't shut off the theme benefit, so now I can actually feat. But it basically means the Wold Weirds can Animus for free, and I can channel, but I don't really need to channel unless I'm going for an assassination because there's no good Affliction targets in this list. I'm just trying to pop off the Demo Core, and now... Dogwood Puppet Masters the Storm Raptor, which will come up. <laughs> and Tanith is not within six to Scything Touch, but she's within range of the Arc Node, which is within six of, to Scything Touch the bird. So she arcs a spell from the other side of the bird back to the bird to Scything Touch. And I'm just trying to figure out, 
does she want to shoot the objective? Does she want to shoot bulkhead? Because I'm trying to... You, he shield guarded the well shot. Because he, I, would, I did that first just to try and bait out shield guard. And I end up deciding like the smart play is to try and control the middle. So I shoot bulkhead. And then like I just boost to make sure I don't miss. Because missing a gunshot like that is really bad. Even if you only need a 3 to hit. Uh, so then I boost damage. It does a few points to bulkhead, and now I shadow bound the middle. The objective shadow bound for what it's worth, which is kind of cute. But it's also worth knowing the objective gets your feet benefit, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's not. It's pretty nice. It's friendly faction. It might not actually. I think it's warrior models only. Maybe I've screwed up the feet. No. No, it's friendly faction models. I just the yeah. cause laws changed so much on that feet that I just don't have it uh, immediately available at my at the tip of my head so what we didn't say was the bird missed its beak attack yep. i rolled a three needing a four and i forgot puppet master was on it because i put the token down upside down so i did not re-roll the attack and i left him on nine boxes with both of his arms up you can see the grid and like i can buy one more attack sit full and i'm like if i sit full a tanker's gonna spray through the bird and kill una but if I don't cripple this guy, because I want to repo back to Una to get base to base for Guardian Beast so I can stop a Juggernaut from killing me, or a Marauder with Guardian Beast, because I'll just disrupt it, and then it's basically worthless. So now it's like, do I buy an attack, cripple an arm, hope I kill it at dice damage, and then, or do I take a free strike? And this takes me like a solid three minutes to the side, and I end up taking the free strike, which... At dice plus one. You roll. Just blows it up yep. at 16 damage to the six. That was exactly what I was needing to try and like rubber band back into this game. So like now that bird is a lot more manageable for me to deal with next turn. Yep. And one of the Man of War Siege Tankers sprayed it last turn and did seven damage. Yeah, he blew that up too. So Shifting Stones healed it for three because I rolled one D3 and I got a three. But yeah, missing the Puppet Master was really dumb of me because now I could have crippled at least one of the arms. And then, like, wouldn't have cared about the free strike if I did the axe, or maybe if I'd gotten lucky and spiked it. Because I rolled pretty well on it. There, Pure Blood just aimed, boosting a few sprays. Like, he boosts into one of them, he boosted into the UA, and then the other ones he didn't, just to get some, like, auto one points. I run one of the Death Wolves and the War Wolf in the way, just to keep, like, the Pure Blood safe for the post feet turn. And I threw away. I can never remember the Death Wolves' names, but the one that has the two little swords, because I don't care about her, because the one that matters to me is the Reach guy. And now Warwolf is just running around in Brian's backfield. I'm trying to explain where I wanted to go, because yeah. I'm being lazy instead <laughs> of walking around. Yeah, I, I probably could have positioned that Warwolf a little bit better, but it got sloppy there just because I was like, I'll get it where it needs to go. Bulkhead is on one box. Uh, I hit with a three because he's shadowbound. <laughs> And I boost damage, and I'm able to do the last one point to him. And then I opt to shoot into melee uh, with the witch mark. It's pretty reliable. So I shoot, boost damage, kill one of them. And the third try, I just try to shoot in. Dice minus nine under feet, does no damage. And that's pretty much it for me. And I'm pretty low on clock. Coming around to this turn, I'm seeing that Ethan's getting real low on time. He's sub 10 minutes already, and I've got a half hour to screw around with this. So I don't have a whole lot of pieces to do a, a ton of things with. I've got, like, the, the man war on the top side of the screen are finally free to do things. But since they're jammed up by two pieces that are, like, you know, it's dicey whether they get them or not, uh, it's basically like they're going to do nothing again because they're not really forwarding the game a whole bunch. They're just contesting a zone and existing, and I guess... Maybe that's fine, but I'd really rather my models actually do things. So I was checking here to see where I could use my Puppet Master objective, and uh, I determined that everything that I want to have Puppet Master isn't going to actually work for me. So I decide to not use Puppet Master at all. Oh, yeah. For, I think we both forgot to say we took the Puppet Master objective because yeah. they haven't taken it away yet, even though they said they are. Yeah, I'll, I'll smoke it if I got it. Um, but then when it's gone, then I'll have to actually, like, use an objective that's somewhat maybe probably not always relevant. Uh, I mean, the next scenario <clears throat> won't be out till 2021, so yeah. we'll have it for a while. Maybe they'll change their minds. Who knows? So my, my grand plan here is uh, I'm thinking 
this is where when when Brian puts his hands like that, he uh, he's thinking hard. Um, I'm kind of struggling with myself on this one. I'm like, okay, I got nine boxes on this juggernaut. He is the only thing that can get to this bird and have a good chance of taking it out with Kozlov's newly granted spell, Jackhammer. So I am sitting here like, if I go up, I can't not trigger Guardian Beast. So do I want to take the gamble that you hit me, which isn't that big of a gamble, but then you need a nine, fully boosted nine, to wipe my jack off the table. So it really is a coin flip. And then even after that, if you take out the axe arm, it's even more of a coin flip on that one because like, I really would like to have my axe to beat you up with instead of just using my fist. But uh, I, I'm, I think at this point, I'm just like, okay, so maybe... I think I was at, at this point, I was kind of still working with the tankers because, like, I think I wanted to keep one of the tankers to kill Una with a spray, and I couldn't really do that the way I wanted to with uh, um, moving through the, the rubble. So I've got Saxon Auric on him, so that's something that I can probably make happen all right, like, with just the spray. But uh, I decide to go for Operation Unpack the Juggernaut into the bird. The bird rolls eight damage, but it does take out my... Uh, my axe. So I have my fist, which isn't great, but at least the juggernaut's still pretty strong. So uh, it shouldn't be too hard to take this out. I have my uh, my Grey Lord adjunct hanging around, so that means I've got my spiritual conduit, which is really important for Kozlov because getting an eight inch jackhammer when you don't have an arc node is super duper valuable. So I decide to start swinging shots into this uh, into this bird. Now Ethan's really hoping to fish for some good damage rolls on the uh, plasma nimbus that hits me back, but uh, as you can see, it's not doing. I'm I'm not doing a lot of damage to the bird, and Ethan isn't doing it back to me. So finally, when I get to the last piece of focus that I have, I end up taking that bird off the table, and uh, now Kozlov is sitting naked, and this is when I realize when that bird comes off that I have two old weirds that have got really good lines on him, and I do have chosen ground up because I needed it to get that juggernaut out of the rubble. So I'm trying to figure out ways that I can try and block off Ethan from getting to my caster. I've got the the tanker that doesn't need to really do anything now other than just maybe run. So uh, if I put him on the right side of the juggernaut, the world weird can run around to the other side. If I put him on the left side of the juggernaut, the world weird can still burn to the other side and grab me because that uh, marauder just didn't quite get into a good spot for trying to block things off. So... Uh, I think I've basically consigned myself to this point at, like, Kozlov is going to die. So let's just try and get rid of some things while we're in the zone up here. So I activate the Manowar Shock Troopers, and finally they got all this pent-up rage, and they're, uh, they're trying to take out... Um, they, they try to take out the Death Wolf and the, the War Dog. Uh, War Wolf, sorry. And they don't. So now my, my uh, Manowar Kovnik has to go up and just, like, shows them how it's done and gets them out of there. It's a moral victory, but I don't feel confident confident that Kozlov's going to make her. And as soon as my turn begins, mm -hmm. I immediately decide to begin Operation Kill Kozlov in seven minutes. Because that's pretty much all the time I have left. Like, I could push Scenario, but now that the bird's gone because of my stupid Pup Master play and only rolling a boosted 8 for damage on the Guardian Beast, it's like, well, Kozlov's naked. He's got an upkeep on him. YOLO. It's also super worth noting that we have not scored a single point this entire game. Yep, it is top of 4, and it's still 0 points. So the Moonhound runs up. He's within marked target range. He has line of sight around the, the tanker, and he's not engaged. Uh, Tanith got Pup Master from the objective. I feat. I channel an affliction. Uh, with dark power, I get an additional die to hit, but I still boost the hit just to make sure this lands, which it does. And now he's afflicted, so now he's down to death 13. 13, yep, goes from 15 to 13. And now with mark target, he's death 11. Tanith walks up, shoots her gun, hits. So now he's shadow bound, so now he's down to death 10 or death 8. Death 9, right? Eight. After everything, so 15 to 13 to 11, 11 to 4 eight. to... Yeah, to Jab eight. 3. Yeah. So now... Well, 4 from 11, 7, so... Jab binds minus 3. Uh, so I pulled out a bleed and I boost damage, so now he's on 2. So I just need, like, one weird shot. Uh, Witch Mark hits, and then I boost damage and kill Kozlov. Yep. Kozlov's down for the count, the Viscount. 
<laughs> yeah, like if if Kozlov wasn't there, like I thought you took that side specifically so Kozlov could hide behind the rock because like you and I have addressed or talked about a storm raptor on Una with bird's eye just ignoring every intervening model. Yep. Like that's how I used to kill casters with the bird cuz it's just like, well, do you have shield guards? If the answer is no, then I try to shoot your caster through everything. And obstructions and buildings are the one thing bird's eye doesn't see, see through. Yep, and I I think I was just being trying to get the feet where I need where I wanted it to to get that bird taken care of because like I just really wanted to throw a ton of damage on him with those man war demo core and I swear I had that second one in and I thought between the two of them I'd be able to hurt the bird enough to really get it down to where maybe the uh, the the sh- the tankers could do work to it because I knew that one was going to get hermited. I didn't when I recognized that the one mana war was out of uh, threat, what I should have really just done is held the feet for a turn and then just like giving you some demo core to chew on and then just see where the turn takes me instead of trying to play this like short, short return on trying to get the bird because the, one of the things about Kozlov that made this game at least unique for me to work with is that I'm not used to playing Kador casters without having some kind of speed buff that they can apply consistently throughout the game. So I think Kozlov would be really w- would be really uh, serviced by having Sorsha Zero in a list, but unfortunately I just really think he feels best in Mana War, and I can't get access to that in here. So uh, it's it, I have to time the feat perfectly, and it has to be delivering the bulk of my army instead of trickling them in and that house and rock really kind of hindered that a little bit i think i would have been better serviced better served by taking your side of the table Mm -hmm. uh you would have just had to like on the top zone like split around that building just like the other one but then yeah you wouldn't have the rock my well placement gets a little funky and i think like when we talked about the sides you're like you're like okay does this obstruction really stop you and i'm like well the bird just flies so yeah i'll probably just run over it turn one or turn two and not care and you're like ah that's true uh, but we didn't actually like put down a huge base and see if i could fit the back of my base through there i mean it's big enough for a huge base i didn't know if i could like fit over the rock entirely yeah if it would take you a couple turns to get there or something so definitely like some 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 issues on my part uh first mostly because i don't play armored core often uh, and second of all, I just think uh, a little rusty after taking a little bit of time off from the game. Yeah, I think both of us are rusty. And like, I was on my turn. I was just like, man, looking up rules. Like, I am so gonna clock. Yeah, I know that was that twenty minute turn two that we missed in the in the video was like, I was just sitting there. I was like, man, Ethan, what are you doing? You haven't moved anything. I mean, I killed a battle engine and you shot did. some yeah, shock yeah, yeah, troopers, yeah. and I was like, Ooh, pew pew. Bird. If that's like the the smallest hole in your belt that you can put in there, that's like, I killed a man or battle engine. Yeah, I think it's more 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 uh, prolific that you actually played against one period. <laughs> it has been a long time. It's been a couple <laughs> years since Butcher One Battle Engines was. I all still the rage. like I still like that list. I just don't want to spend another eighty or one hundred and sixty bucks on battle engines for it. And like it's just got it's got one really powerful turn on feet, and then it's just like butcher does nothing. For yep, him it afterwards. is. It is high risk and maybe medium reward. I don't know. I mean, I'd rather just is, play Niss and Winterguard. The problem is like that one. The battle engine you were playing, it's single shot. Like it was yeah. super good when like battle group heavy lists were popular, but now we've kind of devolved back to infantry machines. So it's like, ooh, I smited one infantry dude, maybe into another one. And it's like, too bad there's. 20 more where that came from that's kind of like the 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 man warp you almost you almost summed it up perfectly that the man war battle engines are the uwu battle engines uwu uwu oh god so with that we've got plenty of time to kill here so i figured we could talk about the battle box casters a little bit if you don't really care to listen to it you don't have to but uh you, you probably haven't made it this far anyways um, no, nah, man, people are going to be excited. They're going to be like, oh, you posted the video. Oh, yeah. I want to see how Big Top Gaming's doing. I'm sure they're playing very, very high caliber games. Exactly. And they're both yeah. very the, pin- the, pinnacle, the pinnacle of competitive play right here. And I had to like take out my 7-inch <laughs> sticks. I tried deploying at 10. I was like, wait, I'm going first. Yep. How does this game work again? Yep. Got to, if you just, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. So anyways, the main reason why we did this battle report is because Ethan and I are both like, we both played basically. It's kind of funny that we did, did it this way, but these were our main factions. We both kind of first started the game with these. And uh, I know that 
in the beginning you really liked Tanith, and then it just kind of turned into not liking her so much in the Mark III launch. And for Kozlov, I was like, he's cool, but he's basically like a not great Irusk. He was like, he wanted to be like the love child of Butcher and Irusk. Mm -hmm. Like he wanted to try and have the melee output of Butcher while having like the supporting of his army like Iris, and you did both of them just not as good. Yeah, it, when you split roles like that with casters, they just end up lo losing effort. Like, there's always someone who does the one th one side of that better. So, like, if you wanted to play the the melee damage game, you just like play a play butcher one. And if you wanted to play the more tactical infantry focused uh, endurance army, then you just play Irusk. Once Ethan and I got done finishing this battle report. Uh, we ended up having a discussion surrounding all of the updates that happened to the battle box casters, and uh, that ended up becoming a lot longer than what we thought it was going to, so I've decided to scalpel that audio out and kind of turn it into another podcast episode. I have a description in the link below to that if you wanted to check that out if you haven't already, so that's why this thing's kind of ending a little bit more abruptly than they usually do, but uh, I didn't want to turn this into almost a two-hour battle report. So thanks for watching, and let us know in the description below what you think about the Battlebox caster changes and what you've liked or haven't liked with them, and especially if you've started making any lists with them. Uh, we'd just like to see kind of what's going on out there with people in these wonderful changes.